Hello and welcome to Russians with Attitudes. Get excited mm-hmm. for a very special guest tonight, Amy Therese. I hope I am pronouncing your name right. Hi, Amy. Hi, how are you going? <laughs> yeah, perfect pronunciation, by the way. Unlike myself Thank you. with your name. <laughs> First of all, the most important question. Would you eat a boiled moose tongue? Mm, no, I don't think so. I mean, sure, if there was in, like if there was some inordinate amount of money and it may be, but otherwise, no. I was um, vegetarian for a number of years, so I definitely don't think I'd have the stomach for it. <laughs> yes, uh, you're missing out, but okay. <laughs> How did your Christmas go? Yeah, it was good. It was, it was a little bit sad like it was tinged with a little bit of sadness insofar as um well normally because i have like mixed mixed um like my family's of like mixed backgrounds so one half of my family is lebanese and the other half is just like um australian and so usually how it breaks down is like we spend Christmas Eve with like the Lebanese half of the family and celebrate on Christmas Eve. And then um, Christmas Day with like the Aussie side of the family, we usually have like a barbecue during the day. Um, but this year, because my Australian grandpa is really sick, um, I skipped the, like I had to skip like the Christmas Eve stuff and just spent christmas day with him and like the aussie side of the family (laughs) so it was a bit different but it was really nice being able to spend like one last christmas with him because he's been in hospital for the past like quite a lot over the past couple of months so we brought him home like last wednesday and then he's at home now at least until until it gets dire (laughs) so so it was nice it felt like really lucky to be able to have one last christmas with him (laughs) how about you the Russian Orthodox the Christmas Orthodox? will be right. on seven, oh, yeah, right, on seventh right. of uh, January. So it's a bit early. But uh, Kirill, uh, what was Christmas like in Germany? Well, I don't know. We don't really celebrate the Western Christmas either. We didn't do anything special. So I don't know. Uh, usually, people just stay with the families and so on and exchange gifts and whatever. But um, yeah. Actually, Amy, I didn't know that you were half Lebanese and half uh, Australian. Do you have a personal joke, you know, like uh, that American comic has about being half Indian and half Japanese, so he buys sushi oh. from 7-Eleven? <laughs> Do no, you right. have a, a joke of your own background? Honestly, well, actually, like, see, the funny thing is, like, it seems to me that in most other countries in, around the world, like... Lebanese sort of have this stereotype of being like really hospitable and like good food and like relatively good at business. But for some reason, it will, I know the reasons, but due to a bunch of shit that happened in like the 1990s and early 2000s, Lebanese and Australia have like really bad stereotypes attached to them. So people think of you as like, of Lebanese people as either like terrorists or like, gang rapists who like drive you know souped up cars and that sort of thing so 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 you can make i often make not often but occasionally make jokes about like you know getting my liberties cousins onto someone but like they're all like professional class like tertiary educated women (laughs) so it's just like they're not actually scary to anyone at all but yeah there's sort of this like thuggish um stereotype out there (laughs) Have you been to your home country lately? No, never actually. Oh. Like over the entire never. never. Not not even one time. Like over the course of my childhood, um, myself and my siblings would often, like, you know, every couple of years sort of try to hassle dad to take us there. Um, or and then even as adults for a little while we were like, Why don't you come with us? It'll be fun, like we should go. But like it seemed like every time we brought it up or like sort of floated the idea, um, bombs started going off and things got crazy. So like every single time it's been like, oh shit, maybe not. (laughs) Especially because like we want to go with my dad and he's like really like cautious, like nerdy type of person. Whereas my other cousins were just like, no, it's never going to be a good time. You just have to go. Like it doesn't fucking matter. But yeah, still haven't quite got there. 
Yeah, I would like to go myself one day to Lebanon. It sounds like a nice place, a fun place, I should say. So please tell us about yourself and why do you think uh, so many Middle Eastern, excuse me, Mediterranean women are so savagely political when they get into Anglosphere? <laughs> you, Syrian girl, Anna Hachian, Rana Harbi, the list goes on. Why is that? That seemed a really interesting question. I've never really thought about that at all. Well, I suppose one thing might be that, like, I don't know, like, I mean, my grandmother was never, like, overtly political in the sense of, like, you know, being super aware of, like, Australian politics or whatever the fuck. But she was so savvy and so, like, I guess powerful in a sense despite being like four foot eleven or something she just like always knew what was going on was always extremely hip to like the dynamics around her so I, I sort of wonder whether like the degree of kind of subtle um authority that um women from that part of the world actually have sort of within their own circles and within their own families like it's very easy i think for western women to sort of look at the sort of more traditional gender roles or sort of like you know heteronormative family structures or whatever and and transpose this like oh these women are oppressed bullshit from the outside but then actually like at least in my experience all of the women that i know <laughs> from those sorts of backgrounds are actually like the exact opposite of that. They're very like self-assured and you know what I mean? So Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that uh, Middle East uh, is uh, hiddenly matriarchal in a lot of ways. Uh, yeah, like, like it's never sort of this zero-sum binary the way that like Western libtard feminists sort of want for it to be, you know what I mean? It always appeared to me that in more traditional societies, women have kind of more soft power. Like even if they have less <laughs> formal power, they have absolutely. an immense amount of soft power in decision making within families. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's this really distortionary kind of thing that these like middle and upper class feminists do where, well, I guess it's sort of internal to liberalism, right? This idea of like liberation, like li like it's all about the end like the core subject in a liberal society is like the individual and so from there it's sort of difficult to conceive of the individual like in a relational manner so to me like the idea of being like this sort of individual who's like totally free and liberated that to me just sounds like fucking tyranny you know <laughs> like i don't want to have to make every decision i I don't even conceive of myself like individually as like a, like what does life even mean if you're just this like free floating individual? No, like life only has meaning when your life is like embedded with a set of other people. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Like, I, I mean, uh, for like 99% yeah. of human history, the basic social unit was the family and not the individual. Right. So um, uh, it's right, kind exactly. of uh, unnatural in a way. A lot of these liberal women also read a kind of normative valence into, like, for instance, if you were to say something like it's unnatural, they would be like, well, how dare you? You're being bigoted towards, like, X people and Y people and, like, gender and families are all just socially constructed, blah, 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 all this other shit. I'm like, look, sure, the ways in which specific sort of family formations are, like, lived out and enacted in the world, yeah, that's that's socially constructed necessarily, right? But, like, I mean, ultimately there is a biological imperative there. Like, I'm sorry, but at the end of the day, like, if th 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 there are actually sort of certain, like, things that you guys can't alter as much as you would like to, as much as you would like to be, like, self-replicating part of people who have no dependence on anyone else whatsoever. Like, that's just not the fact of human existence. Like, people need each other. <laughs> like, needing other people is totally, totally human. And I think you can actually live a much more feel, full life when you society enables that and provides that as a form of stability rather than just encouraging people to just, like, be these sort of self-actualizing blobs. Yeah. I think that entire existence of the whole gang of uh, fierce Middle Eastern women in the Anglosphere, which are much more interesting than Anglo women, proves that uh, the social constructivism doesn't really work. 
In my opinion, Anglo women are much more submissive and they have much more fetishes about daddies and stuff like that than the women from supposedly patriarchal society actually do. So let's get the elephant uh, out of the room and I should ask you, what made you create a podcast What's Left and why every single pronouns in the bio DNC Shill on Twitter talks about you all the time? <laughs> um, it's really funny actually. So long story short, um, kind of in, I think it was maybe tw 2017, around the middle of 2017, I started using my Twitter account. I'd had it for the better part, like I'd had it since like 2009 or something, but I'd really used it like five times, whatever. Like it wasn't really something I used. And I just started using it in 2017. I thought the political moment and its contradictions were really interesting. Um, and I was still, I think, quite naive to the, naive and hopeful in terms of the prospects for like a Bernie Sanders and a Jeremy Corbyn to sort of reinvigorate some kind of like working class formation through um, through sort of the, the national economies of their respective countries. I mean, I wasn't super controversial in 2017. I don't think my account was still pretty small, but um, I struck up a friendship with a guy who had a podcast. And a few months later, like at the very, I think early on in 2018, he asked me to come on and be a co-host. And so... I did that for the better part of a year and then by then it was getting very close to the beginning of the Bernie Sanders campaign and I I mean I can only see this clearly in retrospect but basically like I think it became apparent to him that I was going to be a liability because I didn't quite understand like the rules of the game in terms of like um, there are certain things you can't say you can't piss off certain people, like you need to sort of um, toe the party line to one effect or another. Um, and so he, in his words, fired me. Um, I would point out that for the better part of a year, I hadn't, it's not like I was employed by him. I wasn't paid anything. So like, it's kind of funny to think of it as whatever. Anyway, the point being that, um, so just before I left that collaboration, he'd actually asked somebody else to, to join it. So it was going to be the three of us. Um, but then, yeah, but then he just sort of like shut the bed and changed his mind. And, and so the two of us that were left, um, that was myself and Ben Studebaker. And so then that's why we created What's Left. We just sort of wanted to contribute to the ongoing discourse around the Bernie campaign and sort of we had enough connections with people who were like in the campaign and in the left media that we knew they were listening basically from the jump and so we thought it was a good vehicle for us to sort of both be able to say some of the things that other people in in media weren't saying and weren't able to say um and also just for our own sort of purposes like it was clarifying to us to sort of you know chat with each other once or twice a week to sort of get a feel for for how the campaign was going and that sort of thing um oh why do they hate me i don't know i think i was just a very useful foil for them because i don't give a fuck and yeah sometimes i flinch sometimes i get like especially last year so look it was sort of at a certain point, like they they'd start to break me and they'd get like a little bit emo about it or whatever. But like for the most part, I don't give a shit, and they can't shut me up with any of their "we're gonna get you fired" type threats. And so I think that's just like an increasing. And also, it it's like if you're a blue check loser, and there's one person who's saying all these really annoying troublesome things that are making you and your other blue check loser friends look bad then it almost becomes kind of like a kind of like a bounty hunter type exercise like there's a certain price on landing a good hit on this person who's becoming a pest to all of you and and there's no price as well like because i wasn't within very consciously not within any of the institutions um that 
they need to pay deference to if they want to have a decent career. Um, there was no cost associated with shitting on me, but there was a very high reward if they managed to land a few blows. So I think, I think that's basically, basically why. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you, Amy. Um, I'd have two further questions to you about this. Mm -hmm. uh, the first is, uh, how did you get involved uh, specifically in US politics? Because I often see this in Anglosphere countries, um, since uh, their own countries are kind of boring, I guess, or I don't know, or they have very uh, stable, established politics that are never going to get shaken up in any way. Um, that people just uh, concern themselves with American politics, like all Canadians, all online Canadians. I know they never talk about Canadian politics. They always only talk about <laughs> US politics. And the second question would be, um, did you consciously um, not involve yourself in any kind of activism because you think that um, all like concrete political activism, as you said, you never joined institutions, uh, did you ever do any real life activism, or do you uh, have you <laughs> always thought, <laughs> <laughs> or have you always thought that analysis is uh, more useful at this moment? Um, in all honesty, I oh maybe I'll answer the first question first. So um, in Australia, our most sort of progressive um, prime minister who instituted like basically a nice strong social welfare state and basically dragged the country out of like a very very conservative era where we had had the same conservative prime minister for like 20 years so this guy uh, Gough Whitlam was elected in 1972 and yeah so he repealed the repealed the draft, uh, started to initiate sort of indigenous land rights, um, made higher, like tertiary education, was, became free, instituted Medicare for all, a whole bunch of like just very like social democratic type universal reforms. Um, and then basically the CIA in conjunction with the Queen um, and with the opposition leader and the governor general um, basically cooed him out of office um and so like for the longest time australia has always been a very useful little bitch boy for the states in terms of militarism but yeah basically it's very clear to me that um sort of what happens here politically just kind of mindlessly follows what happens in america um almost without even almost without even any deliberation, like democratic deliberation. It's just like we sort of like adopt it slowly um, and intuitively. We just sort of where you go, we follow, if that makes any sense. So like by the time it gets here, it's already like a default option because we're just so fundamentally fucking neoliberal. Like if you wanted things to change, they would need to change in the States before they, before we just like reflexively adopt it in like five to ten years. Basically. So um, basically, yeah. Australia is colonial and colonial politics are boring because they I mean, just, kind uh, of. I wouldn't go quite to the extent of colonial, but I mean, to a large extent, we're just like a sort of like an administrative, it almost sometimes feels like an administrative outpost of the US as opposed to like a place with substantive politics of our own, if that makes any sense. Like, we are so fucking technocratic, it's not even funny. I mean, in many ways, it's it's not necessarily a bad thing. I think to a large extent, a lot of it is due to the fact that we have had a pretty decent economy. I mean, it's not great, but it's been decent enough and the social welfare, like, safety net has existed enough for a considerable period of time that, like, Australians are very, like who gives a shit about politics um i think in part because of that so i mean in many ways it's good like we don't have the psychotic like politics as lifestyle brand that it seems to be the case in the u.s but don't you have any british influence yeah so like the politicians will yell at each other for an hour a day in parliament like the q a time which i think americans love because they're not used to seeing that where they sort of like heckle each other like the politicians will heckle one another for an hour in in parliament is that what you mean like that's the british influence, i think oh maybe so but uh, is um, 
British uh, system and uh, ideologies, are they different from American ones? And yes. aren't you tied to Britain no. more? No, we were, the con we were the convict outpost. We were like a prison colony. We're the oh, dregs. We the, well, we, yeah, we are the dregs of <laughs> Britain. I see, I see. <laughs> they right. shipped us off to Van Diemen's land because they didn't even want us there. <laughs> like, but, there's, but yeah, there's very much none of that sort of like... One thing I do actually really love about Australia, always have loved about Australia, is that like... Um, although some sort of individuals can be pretentious or whatever, like we're not culturally pretentious. There is very much more of sort of an egalitarian ethos, like even sort of rich people and like elite institutions don't have, I think, to the same degree, the sort of cultural... The hierarchy that exists is basically one of for natural capacity, but there's not necessarily the associated snobbery or whatever if that makes sense. When I first saw Australians in real life, I immediately thought that they were English-speaking Russians. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, you are more, much more similar from all the Anglo nations to Russians. You're like an antipode of the British, so it's good. That's really interesting. I wonder whether that's sort of like the social egalitarianism that was sort of like basically enforced for the I guess time. it's a prison culture <laughs> what? all right okay i see okay all right we're all in this together right they're cellmates basically yeah cellmates Fuck, and the neoliberal like bullet. amy a few days ago you tweeted that you don't uh, that you have difficulties finding a concise uh, label for your views that can like express what you believe in uh, one or a few words yeah i mean the the existing labels i think that i would that i do in fact like that like if forced to i would i would certainly like i would say yeah i guess like theoretically i'm a communist but like what, is, what the fuck is a communist in theory you know like I, i mean i'm definitely like marx has been sort of the one of the most formative influences in the way i sort of see the world or whatever but like again I think that those labels have come to signify so many different disparate people and groups in the present and then also like um, states and militants and governments and really, I guess, sects um, over the course of the last like 150 odd years that I'm just not really sure how effective they, like that term, say like Marxist or communist, I'm not sure that that, that it is effectively communicating what I want it to communicate um, because it seems to me especially that like you, you know you have groups like Black Lives Matter which are totally astroturfed like racial fucking hotep foot soldiers for the Democratic Party funded by you know Soros and yet we're supposed and like you know people like Bezos and all the others like can't get enough of them and then like they actively refer to themselves as Marxists and so do all these like other incredibly like wealthy identitarian losers at academic institutions and so like if that term Marxist is communicating to people that I'm kind of like some kind of like critical theorist who wants to like break down race and gender norms that's like not my politics at all if that's sort of what people like do you get what I mean like it's it's almost like if I use those terms I have to then like spend five minutes explaining why that doesn't mean what you think it means <laughs> and also and also here's what I actually believe <laughs> you know what I mean so it's, it's, it's almost like I'm almost just better I mean yeah there's a lack of particularly useful terms in the present but I guess usually I just like to say like I just want working people to be able to live decent lives um, and I think that that first and foremost requires the resources to do so. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, but um, historically speaking, uh, it's kind of the most basic Marxist tradition to hate all other Marxists and the foremost communist praxis of actually existing communist governments was to kill communists. So uh, I think it's kind of a 
normal for communists to hate each other, or isn't it for even slight deviations from a certain uh, specific communist dogma? Oh, yeah, like, I don't hate anyone, I don't care, but I just, I guess... One thing I would suggest is that, yeah, all the, like, all actually existing, this is another reason why I don't like label, is, like, all actually existing communist so-called societies or governments or whatever, they've all just been capitalists. Like, even the Bolsheviks, like, I'm sorry, but their role was to help, dra like, at least when we look at it historically, it's, I certainly don't think that was their intention, but ultimately they just help, you know, a, a drag russia out of sort of a more <clears throat> pardon me feudal set of social relations into a more bourgeois set and like uh, the whole of the 20th century was state capitalism in every single one of these um countries that is referred to as like socialist or communist so to my mind yeah like like i am not an apologist for any of that bullshit i think it was ridiculous but I guess what I would just suggest is like it, that it's all been capitalism all the time. It's just like with increasing or decreasing degrees of redistribution or like increasing or decreasing degrees of centralization in terms of the amount of control that the bourgeois government has over the distribution of resources, over the way that like lives are lived, over the way the economy is structured, that sort of thing. No. Um, I remember that you had a logo on your podcast on what's left um, mm -hmm. uh, at some point. Um, he is, <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too, me too, of course. Um, he's the foremost prophet of Alexander Kozhev in the modern world. Have you read Kozhev or are you familiar with his theory? Because, really? because Kozhev's point of view is kind of that, yes, the socialist countries of the 20th century were basically state capitalists, but that's good. So, that's fine, um, yeah. Yeah, so in, like, in, in like in like in his theory, Henry Ford uh, was the greatest Marxist of the 20th century, and uh, the USSR was basically backwards because it was not state capitalist enough. It was like uh, 19th century France economically in his view, and uh, the evolution was uh, to be like a, a mix. Uh, I, I think there were several people in the early 20th century who basically prophesized that communism and capitalism would just merge together. Like uh, the famous uh, Kalergi, uh, Kozhev said this as well, and uh, I guess uh, Fukuyama in some midwit version <laughs> of the theory uh, that yes, communism uh, and capitalism would okay. just kind of form some kind of uh, chimera um, and... Uh, I think well, I would just um, argue, like always already, it was always already. Because if we're talking about socialism, what we're fundamentally talking about is an overthrow in the current mode of production and then everything that results from that. And so I'm sorry, but in Russia, you still had a commodity form. You still had a set of people who are of a different class than the rest of the people so I'm, i mean yeah sure i do actually think in many ways like it's arguable to suggest like you could arguably suggest that um perhaps it was say superior to some other like just regular forms of capitalist you know states in terms of like it was probably a bit more distributively a bit more equal or whatever but then like yeah. I think the one thing I would say is that Marx also recognized like very much that capitalism and capitalist development of the productive forces of an economy, of a society, that was a necessary predicate for anything socialist. Do you get what I mean? So he was saying like capitalism is good, not insofar as it's like inherently good. It's just that like it's an inherent, it's a, it's contingently good insofar as it's a necessary um, step between sort of a feudal um, way of living and then like, and then whatever is to come after that. Like you can't just go from sort of monarchy or whatever, like being a bunch of feudal serfs and then sort of jump to some kind of like some far flung future without the actual uh, productive forces to be able to, do that <laughs> like yeah, you I'm, actually need wage slavery for at least for a period of time to be able to industrialize your economy and that sort of thing so yeah i am familiar with uh, the basic tenets of dialectical materialism but 
Oh, sorry, it, sorry. <laughs> is, isn't, it, isn't it kind of uh, proven wrong by the fact that um, we have had uh, hyper capitalist uh, societies for uh, basically a century now? And uh, the way the Western or the most developed societies are moving is decisively not into some kind of communist utopia, but we are just moving uh, kind of back to feudal times, but uh, mm. except, except that the aristocrats don't have any moral commitments or any kind of uh, ethos that or any responsibilities to what they served as they had in uh, historical feudalism. So it's just kind of... Uh, fake and gay feudalism but um <laughs> sorry yeah absolutely <laughs> sorry <laughs> so funny hearing fake and gay in your accent <laughs> sorry <laughs> i'm such a child <laughs> subscribe to our patreon or gumroads to get the full version of the podcast thank you